Today, we're with Michael James Winkleman. Dr. Winkleman is retired from the School of Human Evolution and Social Change at Arizona State University. He has served as president of the Anthropology of Consciousness section of the American Anthropological Association and was the founding president of its Anthropology of Religion section. He's published two books and many peer-reviewed articles. Please check out the included links to educate yourself further on his work. I'm excited to share with you ideas from Dr. Michael James Weekle discussing drug policy reform. All right, talking again. How are you this afternoon? Okay, all right. We can we can hear now. Good. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you so much for taking the sure. time. Um, we are recording right now. Uh, I'm with Dr. Michael James Michael. Winkleman. Michael James Winkleman. Michael James Winkleman, uh, who is a doctor of sociology and identifies as an anthropologist. Um, and Dr. Winkleman is here to talk to us today about drug policy reform. Okay, well, I guess we're already live and on it, huh? We are. Um, if we run a little long, we can break this episode up. Um, if you'd like to tell our listeners a little more about yourself, that would be great too. Okay. Well, I was going to try to organize my material, but hopefully I got it all together. Um, I started off as a physics major my freshman year of college. And, you know, LSD and psilocybin changed that and turned me into an anthropologist that studies shamanism and entheogens and altered states of consciousness. I've all, always been kind of a unconventional anthropologist because while trained as a cultural anthropologist i've been very interested in biological and evolutionary explanations of human behavior so um, shamanism led me down that path realizing that a phenomena that's found in, in many societies around the world can't be explained as a strictly social and cultural phenomena that when we have a phenomena that is manifested across places and time it's got something to do with our human nature. And so much of my career has been trying to understand the biological basis of shamanism, the role that psychedelics play in shamanic development, shamanic experience, and, and ultimately the origins of religion. So I'll, I'll probably just keep the, the biography to, to that little bit and use our time to talk about the ideas that you want to talk about today. Excellent, that, that actually ties beautifully into my first question. Um, I'd like to get your opinions on why people do change their consciousness, um, despite knowing that what they put into their bodies might be harmful, could be illegal, or it could be both. Well, I would start off saying that changing consciousness is part of human nature, that the drive to alter consciousness is probably as fundamental as the drive to experience dreams or deep sleep. I've talked about an integrative mode of consciousness if I pull it off here, I'm going to show these two books. Hopefully you're seeing them. Um, shamanism in which I, I look at how it is that humans have evolved over time to utilize the altered states of consciousness that are part of our experience of the world. Uh, do the books come up for you there? I don't see any books, no, sir. Ah, okay. Well, anyway, I was hoping to have a chance to make sure I this all worked out before we started. but. In my book, Shamanism, uh, I talk about the way in which we evolve through the capacity to experience ritualized induced altered states of consciousness. And in these ritualized altered states of consciousness, what we're able to do is to integrate aspects of our consciousness into our everyday life. And this is not what we're able to do normally, to bring in deep aspects of our unconscious abilities. And so what I want to be able to, to do is to show people how they can alter their consciousness in a way that enhances access to the unconscious. And this is something that we don't normally have access to. So one of the other books that I'd hope to be able to show up here, Altering Consciousness, that shows how the alteration of consciousness is relevant for understanding diverse aspects of human nature. And it's part of, you know, the inspiration of religion. It's part of the ways in which people, you know, for instance, I get insight. It's part of the ways in which people, you know, get inspiration for writing literature or for painting. There's aspects of our unconscious 
that are brought into consciousness through altered states of consciousness. Uh, these are so basic that they're created by many different things. Fasting will create altered states of consciousness. Meditation will create altered states of consciousness. Um, various drugs will create altered states of consciousness. And, and in fact, we've even evolved to be more efficient at using drugs to alter consciousness. So we get enhanced survivability from the ability to use exogenous neurotransmitters as a way of increasing our alertness, increasing our strength, increasing our reaction time, relaxing when we need to relax, enhancing sociality, etc. So using drugs is part of human evolution. It's been part of our selection for at least six million years uh, in terms of the psychedelics and far longer than that in terms of other substances. So it's normal and natural that we want to alter consciousness. Now, despite underlying negative burdens brought on, brought on by drug possible addiction or repetitive use, people tend to fall back into this repetitive, repetitive cycle with some substances. Why might that be? Well, okay, let's see. Are you getting this picture now? Addiction and the dynamics of altered states of consciousness? I don't have a picture. Um, we will work to, to drop links to these into our show notes. Okay, well, anyway, I, I would say that people fall into addictions because the addicting substances basically mimic our neurotransmitters. And our neurotransmitters are able to enhance our ability to function, and so addicting substances also enhance various functions. But one of the things that they do is they start to replace the normal production of neurotransmitter substances. So we become dependent upon these exogenous sources in order to be able to enter into those altered states of consciousness. Also, addictive patterns that are destructive are often uh, created by people, places, and things. Around people we use with, uh, places where we use, uh, things that we are associated with using. So we sort of fall back into the same old patterns because our use of drugs is associated with a learned set of uh, local circumstances. So we have these behavioral patterns that are linked to our sense of well-being but they're linked to our sense of well-being through learning habits and also we have these dynamics of addiction that have to do with the focus of consciousness a uh, very restricted focus of consciousness is created by addictive drugs and we stay focused on those very narrow aspects of what make us feel good and, and don't open ourselves up to other kinds of experiences for instance there are a lot of addiction programs now that are experimenting with the nature experience. You know, you take people then put them out in nature and all of a sudden you've got all kinds of other experiences to fill your consciousness with and the drugs aren't as important anymore. Wonderful. Let me just add into here that my wife tells me that you need to allow sharing for me to be able to show you my images and that's ah, why okay. they're not coming up. Uh, learning curve for both of us. Wonderful. Um, let me see if I can see how to do that. Well, if not, we can just go on. And <laughs> share. I think it's a share for everyone or something. Let's see. You hover over the bottom of the screen. She says you should get an option for sharing. Enable waiting room. Mute, unmute, mute. Well, that's okay. Yeah. We'll let it go. Yeah, as I said, we'll 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 get some links in there so that people can uh, continue to research on their own. Um, okay. We're talking about drugs. The term drug poses a really vast controversial effect. Um, research shows that alcohol and tobacco both fall into the drug category. Um, very socially acceptable in America. Can you explain how our society came to conclude the classification of the term drug, um, as well as maybe when we decided, uh, started to decide what's socially acceptable and what is considered illicit? Okay, well, to understand America's relationships to drugs, you have to go back to the very first successful English settlement in the Americas. Before the Jamestown colony, all the previous English efforts to establish colonies in the America ended up in death and all the people died or returned to England. It was Jamestown, the colony built on smoke, that was the foundation for the English presence in the Americas. 
and they were economically successful because they cultivated tobacco. So tobacco became the economic foundation for the English colonies in the America and became a deeply ingrained part of the colonial life. In addition to this, the American colonies got engaged in international commerce and attained financial success through a often called a trade triangle, although it was more of a quadrangle, between Africa, the Caribbean, the colonies, and England. Slaves went from Africa to the Caribbean to produce sugar. Sugar was used to uh, produce alcohol, both in the Caribbean as well as up in the colonies. And then the alcohol was traded to England in exchange for manufactured goods that were sent to Africa to get slaves, to send slaves to the Caribbean and the colonies to produce sugar, to produce alcohol, to buy manufactured goods. So the other basic foundation of the American economies was the production of alcohol. And so from the very basis, these were the foundations of the American economy. And it's little surprise that, you know, 250 years later, we're still talking about these as being socially acceptable substances, even though they're highly destructive, probably the most dangerous of all the commonly used drugs, and one of the bases from which uh, we continue to accept them into social life while we demonize other substances. So why do we demonize other substances? I'll just briefly point out the whole prohibitionist movement in America that briefly outlawed alcohol through a constitutional amendment. It also led to the prohibition of use of other substances, opioids. But most significantly was that when the prohibitionist movement ended, there was this big cadre of federal officials that were hired to oppress alcohol production and sales in the United States. And Alsinger, who was the director of the Bureau at the time, needed to find something for all his agents to do. So the marijuana menace became the focus. And it was a very useful one because at that time it was primarily associated with Mexicans. And it was during the Depression period in which we didn't need Mexican laborers anymore because it all poor Americans that were willing to work in agriculture. And so they focused on marijuana as another drug to keep all these agents employed and to justify, you know, the expelling all of these Mexicans who had come into work in agriculture in previous decades. So fast forward to the 1960s. I mean, LSD, psilocybin were showing great promise as therapeutic tools. Uh, the psychiatric community was highly in favor of them. Uh, and even, uh, you know, major sectors of the population saw them useful. They were being employed by the CIA. Uh, but one of the things that happens with these drugs is that they tend to cleanse consciousness, to interrupt habitual patterns of behavior, to sort of wipe, you know, your previous systems of beliefs aside for a while and give you a new view of the world. And so they were inspiring the hippie movement in the United States. At the same time, you know, cocaine had become more and more prevalent in the black communities in particular because it had been given to uh, Africans and slaves here to get them to work better since the 1800s. So Nixon faced two big problems in the voting segments, hippies and blacks. So the war on drugs is a good way to get rid of a lot of voters that weren't going to ever vote for him anyway. And so the war on drugs really came out of a very explicit effort by the Nixon administration to oppress you know, areas of the society that weren't going to be in favor of what he had to do. Yeah, so the Nixon administration brought about um, our current system that is the Controlled Substance Act that was enacted in, I believe, 1971. Um, what are some of the pros and cons of this system that we've been under for 50 years now? Well, we, we should start off by recognizing that the way the system is implemented is based strictly on politics and political appointees and political decisions. Science has not played any role in deciding what is dangerous and, and what is, is relatively harmless. Because of that, things like LSD and marijuana are considered more dangerous drugs than things like heroin and opium, morphine. You know? So it's, it's not based on science, it's based on politics. But what are the pros of this? Well, I mean, outlawing these substances is a great way to oppress consciousness and to limit the, the range of, of thinking that people have available to them. 
Uh, it's a good way of assuring the continuity of what's been called a male dominator culture. Alcohol has been used for thousands of years for male bonding in societies in which you know, military prowess is the primary concern. Um, it's another good way to deny people access to good medicine. The pharmaceutical companies are against the legalization of marijuana and, and other psychoactive substances because it's going to cut into their profits. They say that, you know, California costs the pharmaceutical industry a billion dollars a year once they legalize cannabis, you know? So there's big, powerful people out there that don't want these things to be widely available. So if you want to make sure that people only have access to highly addictive and destructive pharmaceuticals, our current system is really great. Um, so it's good for the drug treatment industry too. You got plenty of obligatory clients. People get convicted, you know, they have to go through court approved, you know, drug treatment programs, which 90% of the people aren't going to be successful in these programs because they don't work, but it's a still a billion dollar cash cow for a certain sector of the economy. It's a good tool for oppressing minority communities. Uh, you know, the use of illegal substances in the black community is relatively small compared to white community. You say 10% versus 30, 40%. Of course, people who get convicted tend to be largely minorities. So it's a good way to disenfranchise minority voters. I mean, there's a million people in Florida who can't vote. And most of them can't vote because they got convicted of felony drug possession. So it's a good way to keep the power in the hands of white people and don't let minorities effectively exercise their right to vote. And, and it's great for the private prison system. Uh, there's a billion dollar industry, multi-billion dollar industry in the U.S. where private companies create prisons and the federal government uses our tax dollars to pay these private prison systems to put away people for years up to life. And 80% of them are people in there for drug offenses. So, you know, all of these are, are great pros for why the current system is, is good. It's, I mean, it's also at the same time, the cons, you know. <laughs> These are all bad reasons why yeah. the system shouldn't be in place. And, you know, it leads to great loss of human productivity. It's an enormous waste of public resources. It's led to the militarization of police. It's led to, you know, car drug cartels controlling, you know, the, the so-called, you know, failed countries. Um, and it, you know, is given the pharmaceutical companies and the law enforcement agencies and the law enforcement unions a, a disproportionate role in deciding public policy based on their own personal interests, not on the basis of science. So I was being a little sarcastic here in what all the pros are, but I mean, there's a lot of reasons why the system stays in place. It, it, yeah, a pro is, is uh, it depends on your point of view, if that's a pro or a con, for sure. Um, now, I don't have the numbers on, on racial incarceration right in front of me, but I did research um, the National Institute of Health reports that over 50% of U.S. prisoners meet the, the criteria for substance abuse disorder. Um, the Department of Justice reports that recidivism for drug offenses is over 60% for drug-related convictions. Um, what alternative po policy models can we look at to improve these numbers? Uh, let's, well, I mean, let's... to start with decriminalization, you know, if these people really suffer from mental health problems, you know, why make their lives worse by putting them into the criminal justice system? Let's find diversion programs. Let's find other ways to make people better adjusted uh, in the face of whatever substance use problems they may have. And of course, the, the whole definition of substance abuse, you know, is, is somewhat arbitrary. You can have two people using substances in the same way and one can be considered an addict because he has problems with his family and it doesn't work out with his job and he got fired and got arrested and got put to prison. You know, the other guy manages to live his life well, keep his drug, you know, use compartmentalized and, you know, go on living life well. So by the definition of addiction, he's not addicted. The recent, you know, guy who's a, a black professor who's come out saying he shoots up heroin you know, every couple of weeks has been doing so for 20 years. You know, but he's managed to get tenure in a major university. Now, obviously, just because you use heroin doesn't make you a street addict. It depends on the rest of the context of your life. So change the opportunity structure for people. You know, people who sell drugs often find that there's little other legitimate opportunities for them to make money, you know, in, in any you know, good way. So 
using drugs and selling drugs sort of becomes a, a way of life because it provides certain kinds of economic benefits. Take away the criminal aspect of buying and selling drugs, there's not going to be this enormous profit in the same way there is right now. You know, the risk drops, the cost is going to drop as well. Also, we need to think about different treatment approaches. Um, the use of psychedelics as treatments for substance abuse and addiction is well established. They've been doing this in Russia since the 80s, you know, using ketamine hydrochloride. Uh, the addict community in the United States since the 1960s has been using ibogaine as an interrupter and to tool to cease addiction behaviors. Uh, we now have evidence that psilocybin can interrupt alcoholism. We knew that in the 60s with LSD. LSD was probably the most effective treatment for alcoholism that's ever been around. I mean, if you give people a mystical experience, they see their lives differently, they have this transformative you know, change occur, and they can get on with a different path in life. But we could deal with all the major addictions through the use of the psychedelics. Uh, so we need to have you know, a, a more thorough embrace of these alternatives. And we're starting to see that uh, with the approval of, of fast tracking, for instance, psilocybin for the treatment of certain kinds of addictions. Certainly, um, the psychedelics also come with their dangers too. Uh, a certain portion of the population might um, be susceptible to schizophrenia or psycho psychotic breaks. So. I do want to highlight that um, we keep in mind that, that none of these are a panacea. Um, I've also looked at models that are just harm reduction, education. Um, I, I study psychology, so I think very much about um, cognitive behavioral therapy and what we can do to break cycles or just lessen the harm that we do in our lives. Well, I mean, back to the, the harm issue. I mean, if, if you look at the psychedelics, they're harm profile is very, very low. Uh, most people who die from psychedelics do so from jumping out of buildings thinking they can fly. So obviously you need to have a good sitter and, and maybe, you know, lock the windows if you're on a 10th floor building. Uh, but, you know, even the whole issue of people who, you know, have psychotic episodes related to psychedelics, uh, the clinical evidence suggests they almost always had pre-existing conditions. So it's important the screen. Some people aren't going to be good candidates for using psychedelics. Uh, and, and the idea that you might overdose on it, uh, I think the, the estimate based on rat studies is that you'd have to eat like 35 pounds of psilocybin mushrooms to get to a lethal dose. It's not going to happen. <laughs> so, I mean, there's been a lot of scare about the psychedelics. Uh, but, you know, from my perspective, this has been an important part of human healing for Ever since we came down out of the trees onto the savannas and started following, you know, bovine kind of species around to try to spear them and eat them. We've been eating psilocybin for 5 million years. And, you know, studies show that it's a very effective treatment for a variety of, of problems. Uh, chronic depression, you know, treatment resistant depression, obsessive compulsive disorders, uh, addictions, etc. I mean, these are medicines and medicines that have been tried not only in various clinical studies, but by human populations over 5 million years. Uh, these are not dangerous drugs. These are important therapies. Excellent. Excellent. I'm so glad to hear that opinion. Um, kind of running short on time here. Uh, for our audience who has been directly affected or perhaps is close to someone who's been affected by substance abuse or the war on drugs in general, you have any advice on helping to improve individual situations? Yeah. I think we need to go back to my first point. It's normal and natural for human beings to alter consciousness. And drugs aren't the only way. Uh, human societies for millions of years had shamanistic practices using drumming and dancing and music as natural tools to alter consciousness. We can employ these kinds of practices, uh, not only as supplemental therapies, but even as basic therapies. Uh, allow people to engage with the alteration of consciousness through natural, normal, healthy means. Drumming circles are effective ways of engaging these kinds of potentials. Uh, there's evidence that even singing therapy can be effective for addictions. Why? Because dancing and drumming and singing stimulate the endogenous opioid systems. So we have normal, natural techniques to get high, if you will. And so I think people should consider, you know, finding ways to engage in these normal ways to alter consciousness 
doing so in a supportive setting that allows a new pattern of behavior, of psychological you know, orientation, of social relations to emerge. Uh, getting healthy you know, is not something you do by yourself alone in solitary confinement. Being healthy is having relationships with other people, including perhaps effective relationships of using ritual practices for inducing alterations of consciousness. And it doesn't have to be just shamanic. You know, there can be you know, changes that are related to meditation. Meditation has been shown an effective tool in this regard, and, and even religious practices. I know there's been a, a lot of controversy about you know, using religion as the various, you know, various tools for treating with treating psychological problems. But I think even you know, appropriate kinds of religious settings can be a way to help reorient people and get them engaged in the social world where they get positive affect and you know, dopamine related stimulation from good people. So there's a lot of ways to change it, but it's not gonna be putting people in prison. That's the only, only thing you do in prison is wait for you can get out to get high again. You, know? you don't change your orientation to the world. So there's good examples around the world. Portugal's been one. You know, just decriminalize all drugs. You know, get rid of the whole drug enforcement mentality. People who are caught with drugs get diverted to programs that help them get their lives together and establish a, a good social basis for having a happy life. Wonderful, wonderful. Um, so much to digest here. So I invite our listeners um, to check out the links in our show notes uh, to books and scholarly papers that Dr. Winkleman has published. Um, I thank you again so much for taking time out of your day to talk to us. Um, have, have a blessed, blessed afternoon. Thank you, doctor. Thank you, Zach. Bye-bye.